Where do I begin? Hmm. You know, when I read this story, first thing I thought of was I should have someone else read these names, right? And I just feel bad because it's usually a high school student that ends up reading all these names and thinking, oh, how do I pronounce this? Well, do the best you can. And uh, here I am doing the best I can with the names. The second thing was they heard Snickers and things that I was reading about, uh, what was it? Uh, 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 women who don't know their place. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, let's see if any, nope, not here. Okay. The purpose of Esther's story, it's, some scholars think it's a historical um, fiction. Uh, it, it's there to prove a point. It's there to make a story. And you probably noticed and you probably read that there's no mention of God in this story whatsoever. So why do we read this, Esther? Well, why do we listen to parables? Why do we read other stories? And Martin Luther actually wanted to get rid of this. He said, I wish the story had never been written along with James and Revelation, some others that don't even mention Christ. But it's here. After many centuries of struggling with the, the rabbis to keep it in here. And actually the Apocrypha, the Greeks added on to this. So if you read the Apocrypha, you've got more of Esther, but with more God language, because they felt a little bit strange about not having some God language in here. But I think when we read this, and when I read this, I, I understand it to almost be like we live today. You know, we've got this faith that a lot of us don't necessarily talk about every single day or identify ourselves as Christians as we meet people. I suspect that God is playing a role inside, inner, uh, in the inner lives of, of Esther and Mordecai. And, but that's more to come. We'll see. What I want to talk about today is some difficult passages that I struggle with. I have my own views about how life is and how I think God is, is portrayed and what Jesus was standing for, and I have some struggles with some certain verses in Scripture. I'll tell you that right now. See if this sounds familiar. Also that women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with hair braided or gold pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. I let a, a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. Any guesses where that came from? I'm sure you probably all know where that comes from. First Timothy. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the, of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body which he is the Savior. Just as, every, as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Also, that's in Ephesians. I read this passage from Esther, I read these, and I think I have a, a real struggle with this because I see in a lot of ways we haven't changed much from the time 450 B.C. when, when Esther was supposedly taking place with King Xerxes and this whole scenario was happening where they had this, this king and he had a big, if you look on the map, he had a big area that he ruled over. And yet he wanted to, to prance his queen around as an object for their viewing pleasure with wearing only a smile and a crown. And I think, Vashti, good for you to refuse to do that. And yet, today we, we, we have in our media, in our public, in our social circles, this still this subjugation of women in our lives, how they're portrayed in music videos, on commercials, in movies and different things. There is a, a documentary called Misrepresentation that talks about that. The, 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 the society that's viewed mainly in terms of beauty, not brains or personality or anything else, but just the shell, all form and no substance. Have we gone much further than Xerxes' time? In some ways, no. But there are others that say that's not right. We need to make sure that we all have freedom, right? We celebrate July 4th. We say, well, independence of America, the freedom from oppression from Britain and all these other places. Freedom, freedom, freedom. And that's what I think Christ was all about, is giving us freedom to be the people who we are. I've seen too many women that are really strong, independent. Once they get married and they fall into this, and the husbands make them run into this, subjugation stuff and they become shells of their previous selves. I'm not saying that the way you run your household is, is the way you run your household. 
and not saying it's wrong, whatever you're comfortable with. If you want to live however you live, but just feel the freedom to do how you want to do. My wife is better at keeping finances than I am. That's a man's job, isn't it? Well, not necessarily in my case. But her own strengths are different than my own. I married a complimentary person than myself. I'm not better or worse than she is. We're, we're a team together. And that's what we like to do. And that's how we view our marriage. Others are very faithful and have a different way of looking at the relationship between husband and wife. And that's okay too. We read in scripture, not only this kind of behavior, and we see this kind of behavior in our own lives, our own society, what's going on, but we also see some positive role models and some positive examples where God lifted up women. You remember Hagar, right? Abraham couldn't have kids with Sarah, so Sarah said, hey, take my servant Hagar, have a kid with him. And so it happens that she has Ishmael, and then Sarah gets mad and sends them both off in the desert to die, and Hagar leaves her son to die, and all of a sudden an angel comes and talks to Hagar. God don't normally talk to people, but he's talking to this woman. There has to be something there. God, through Gabriel, talks to Mary. The women at the tomb, they were the ones who were faithful to Jesus, even at the cross, even afterwards. We have the woman at the well who's a Samaritan. She's not even Jewish. And yet Jesus shows her favor, learns from her, and says, okay, I guess the dogs do get the scraps. So in other words, it's not only the good news is not only for the Jews, but let's extend it out for the Gentiles as well because of this woman at Samaria at the well. The woman who anointed Jesus with her tears and her hair and oil, she was forgiven much because she had guts to come and praise him and ask for his forgiveness. We have Lydia, that merchant in purple, an axe, who changes her ways and becomes baptized and a follower of Christ. And I imagine she has wealth to support his ministry, as a lot of women did in that time. The poor widow with two coins who gave everything she had so that others could have. These are positive. Some of the positive role models that the women give us. We speak of freedom. We speak of life in Christ. Wholeness. In his last supper, Jesus was giving the wine and the bread and saying, you're all invited to be part of this family of me and to remember me in all of this because I came for all and all can remember me and be part of this family. Baptism. When John was out in the wilderness proclaiming a, a baptism of repentance, of new life, of new exodus, a new people, a new way of life to be reminded who they were as a people of God. People gathered together from all parts of Israel to be part of this, as Jesus did as well, subjecting himself to this job to be poured with water, the lesser baptizing the greater. That's how it is in our world, in this Christian life of ours, to be subjected to each other and having the freedom to be who we are in Christ. This baptism today is a renewal. A renewal of on, not only a new member of Christ into our family, but also a remembrance of our baptism, our family connections, all of our freedom to, to uphold this new life in Christ, to support and give her strength. Sometimes we don't have the strength to give, yet we're together in this. Freedom. Freedom in Christ. That no one, regardless of sexual orientation, skin color, race, creed, will be excluded. 
that we're all part of this family. The purpose of Christ is to bring us together, to show us the way to God, to this new freedom, this new life in Christ. Amen.